Thank you, brother, for including me in that prayer. Good to be together today. In a book entitled, I Am a Church Member, Tom Rainier opens his introductory chapter with a story called A Tale of Two Church Members. I want to share that story with you this morning as we begin. He says that Michael and Liam began meeting for Monday morning breakfast at 6 o'clock over five months ago. They originally thought it would be a one-time event. They met in a couple's Bible study group in their church. For many different reasons, they hit it off and were becoming good friends. When Michael originally invited Liam to meet him for breakfast on a Monday morning several months ago, Liam readily agreed. The two men enjoyed their time together so much that the one-time event became a weekly event. It was now rare for the two friends not to meet on a Monday morning. Early in their friendship, the conversations focused on sports, family, and politics. They had much in common. Michael was 41, Liam was 39. They each had three kids, and they were both college football fanatics. Each of their teams was in the same football conference, but they were pretty fierce rivals as well. The guys thoroughly enjoyed trash-talking the other's team in a friendly spirit. But on this particular Monday morning, the conversation turned serious. Michael and his wife had noticed some changes in the demeanor of Liam in their Bible study group. He no longer seemed as interested in studying and discussing the Bible as he did talking about their church. And his comments were often critical about the congregation where the two families both had their memberships. Still, Michael was caught off guard on that particular Monday morning. Liam loved the poached eggs in the little restaurant. It was his regular order. But on this Monday morning, he had not touched them. He was barely sipping his coffee. Liam didn't take long to get to the point. Michael, he began, Lana and I have decided to leave the church. The pause seemed the last minutes. Neither of the men seemed to know who should speak next. Michael took the initiative and spoke softly and deliberately. You want to tell me about it? Michael inquired. He didn't, didn't know if, if Liam wanted to say any more about it. His friend seemed resolute. Nevertheless, Liam began to explain his feelings and decision. Lana and I went to the church to learn deep truths about the Bible, Liam offered. But the preacher is just not feeding us. We're not getting anything out of his messages. Sitting in the service on Sunday morning is just a waste of our time. Michael didn't respond. He could tell Liam had more to say. There are several great people in the church, Liam continued. You and Karen are the best, and there are a few more like you. He paused, and his facial expression became even more serious. But honestly, Michael, our church is full of hypocrites. Did you hear Jim at the kids' basketball game? He embarrassed me the way he was screaming at the refs. What kind of example is that for a Christian? And, of course, everyone knows about Neil. He was supposedly this pillar of the church, and we find out he's been cheating on his wife for over a year. What kind of church is this with these kinds of people? Liam was angry but controlled as he continued to vent. Look, the preacher acts like he cares for us, but I'm not so sure he does. I told him that... Lana's dad was in the hospital for hernia surgery, and he never visited him. Michael knew that Lana's father was not a member of the church. He lived 50 miles away. He also knew that the preacher had called him and had prayer with him. But he also knew that any rebuttal would not be appreciated at the moment. Michael held his tongue. Now it seemed that Liam's mild rant was winding down. Liam seemed exhausted, ready to bring the conversation to a close. He did, however, offer a few pointed comments 
and two insightful questions. Michael, Liam began softly, I really like you and Karen and your kids. All of you are a class act. He paused briefly. But you seem enthused about the church. You keep serving and contributing. Don't take me wrong, but I wonder at times if you're blind to all the problems in the church. Then Liam offered a, a closing that really spoke more than he realized. We are really two different types of church members, he said. Why is that? Why do we have such different perspectives? Last week, I asked you to think about the possibility that Part of the problem with the church in America today has nothing to do with our increasingly secular culture or our godless politics or even with hypocritical Christians who are often blamed. Is it possible that a big part of the problem that the church is often weak is that many of us church attenders have lost the biblical understanding of what it means to be a member of the body of Christ. And so many expect to be served rather than to serve. They expect to be fed rather than to feed and to be cared for rather than to care. And it's so easy once one has gone down that path, isn't it, to see other people's sins and, and their hypocrisies and to dwell on them. It is so easy to see the speck in our brother's eye when we can ignore the log in our own eye. I want us to take some time this morning again to read a very important passage on this theme from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Last week we read verses 12 through 27 there from the English Standard Version that I normally have before me as I preach. But this morning, uh, for variety's sake, I thought I would read it from something different from uh, Eugene Peterson's paraphrase called The Message. I think he's done a pretty good job overall of rendering this passage in sort of a colorful way and might give us a little bit more insight this morning. So you might follow along in the translation you have or, or look at the one we have up here before you. But again, I just can ask you to, to listen closely to these words from the Apostle. 1 Corinthians 12, beginning at verse 12. You can easily enough see how this kind of thing works by looking no further than your own body. Your body has many parts, limbs, organs, cells, but no matter how many parts you can name, you're still one body. It's exactly the same with Christ. By means of his one spirit, we all said goodbye to our partial and piecemeal lives. We each used to independently call our own shots, but then we entered into a large and integrated life in which he has the final say in everything. This is what we proclaimed in word and action when we were baptized. Each of us is now a part of his resurrection body, refreshed and sustained at one fountain, his spirit, where we all come to drink. The old labels we once used to identify ourselves, labels like Jew or Greek, slave or free, are no longer useful. We need something larger, more comprehensive. I want you to think about how all this makes you more significant, not less. A body isn't just a single part blown up into something huge. 
It's all the different but similar parts arranged and functioning together. If foot said, I'm not elegant like hand, embellished with rings, I guess I don't belong to this body, would that make it so? If ear said, I'm not beautiful like eye, limpid and expressive, I don't deserve a place on the head, would you want to remove it from the body? If the body was all eye, how could it hear? If all ear, how could it smell? As it is, we see that God has carefully placed each part of the body right where he wanted it. But I also want you to think about how this keeps your significance from getting blown up into self-importance. For no matter how significant you are, it's only because of what you are a part of. An enormous eye or a gigantic hand wouldn't be a body, but a monster. What we have is one body with many parts, each in its proper size and place. No part is important on its own. Can you imagine eye telling hand, get lost, I don't need you? Or head telling foot, you're fired, your job has been phased out. As a matter of fact, in practice it works the other way. The lower the part, the more basic and therefore necessary. You can live without an eye, for instance, but not without a stomach. When it's a part of your own body you are concerned with, it makes no difference whether the part is visible or clothed. Higher or lower, you give it dignity and honor, just as it is without comparisons. If anything, you have more concern for the lower parts than the higher. If you had to choose, wouldn't you prefer good digestion to full-bodied hair? The way God designed our bodies is a model for understanding our lives together as a church. Every part dependent on every other part. The parts we mention and the parts we don't. The parts we see and the parts we don't. If one part hurts, every other part is involved in the hurt and in the healing. If one part flourishes, every other part enters into the exuberance. You are Christ's body. That's who you are. You must never forget this. Only as you accept your part of that body does your part mean anything. I love the way that the Apostle Paul talks about church membership in this passage. It's so vivid. Um, It draws such a picture. It's unforgettable, really. The church he teaches us is a body, body with many functioning parts, all of them vital, all of them necessary, none too important, none too insignificant. We're all members of that body if we've been baptized into Christ. Now, there are a lot of different kinds of memberships you know, that you might enjoy in this world. And part of the problem in churches is when people apply worldly standards of membership to that of the body of Christ, the church. For instance, you might be a member of of some kind of club. It doesn't matter what kind, really. Use your imagination. Your club might have a membership fee that you pay some kind of dues, and once you pay those dues, you have expectations, don't you? Uh, Your paid dues entitle you to certain services, and uh, often it involves others doing things for you. One summer several years ago, Uh, Because of uh, one of my aunts, I got to play a round of golf at the 
Firestone Country Club in Akron, Ohio. Very difficult place to get to play. Um, to be a member there is an extremely expensive proposition. But once you are a member there, you get great service. Do you know that when you pull up into the parking area, some young fella meets you at your car and offers to carry your clubs for you to the first hole? I'll tell on myself here a little bit. When that happened, we got out, popped the trunk, and here's this young guy grabbing my golf clubs, and I'm like, hey, wait a minute, what are you doing? And one of my cousins that I was to play with said, he's supposed to do that, that's his job. So it sort of tells you where I normally play golf, but um, I was corrected. And then when you're on the course, people follow you around, offering you a cool drink if you want it. And then after our round, um, they fed us a real nice meal in a, a big plush dining room. Uh, but you know, me and my cousins accidentally sat down in the wrong dining room that afternoon. Uh, it was an even bigger and plusher one than we were supposed to be in. It was the one where the actual members eat their meals. And don't you know, uh, they, they didn't allow us to sit there very long. I think we, we were there 10 or 15 seconds before we were ushered out to our dining room. Uh, they were polite about it, but they got us three yahoos out of there pretty quick. Why was that? Because membership has its privileges in a place like that. The problem is when we transfer that attitude to the church, it does not work. And it does not work because Christ's body was not designed in that way. With country club membership, everybody pays their dues to, in, a, in essence, pay others to work for you. With church membership, everyone has a role. Everyone has a vital function. Everyone has a service to render, a burden to bear, an act of love to perform. Everyone. Did I say everyone? Just as Jesus came to serve and not to be served, in his body, the church, we seek not to be served, but to serve. And so usually, to be a member of a club, be it a country club or Sam's Club or Costco or Planet Fitness, whatever it might be, the main thing you have to do to be a member is to pay your dues. Pay your dues and then you're served. Membership has its privileges. So I was reminded of this once uh, because I had misplaced a bill and that's had failed to pay my membership. We were a member at Sam's Club in, in, in West Virginia where we lived at the time. And I, I forgot, this is in the day before automatic debit of your bills and so forth, you know, the days of the dinosaurs. I didn't pay my bill that month and, and I always bought my, my gas at Sam's because it was always three or four cents cheaper than every place else. And I went to buy my gas on, on Friday and wouldn't let us. I had lost my privileges, you see, based on the fact that I failed to pay. But have you ever considered what one has to do to, to remain a biblical member of a church? Last week, we talked about the fact that God adds people to the church who are baptized into his son and receive his spirit. That's in verse 13 of our passage from 1 Corinthians 12. That's when God adds you 
to his church. But how does one remain, remain a biblical member of the church? Our biblical text here in 1 Corinthians 12 addresses that. And it has to do with being functional. A functional member gives of themselves and serves others. To be biblical as a church member is to be functional. And that brings us back this morning to the body image that Paul uses to teach the lesson here in this great chapter of God's Word. A human body is a a unified organism that has many parts, many functioning parts. And Paul names several of them here. He mentions an eye, an ear, a hand, a foot, a nose. Every one of those parts is designed to function. Every part is expected to work. Don't you expect your body parts to work? And when they don't, don't you do something about it? Well, that's, that, that is the, the image that Paul uses to teach us about the church. Each person has their role. Each has their job. Just as in the body. The eye sees, the ear hears, the hand holds, the foot walks, the nose smells. This is the way it's supposed to be in the body of Christ. Each member has their role, their function, or functions, their job, their jobs. Each has their work of service. Each one of those is vital and needed. Each one is based on gifts and abilities granted by God. If you look at the close of this chapter, Paul addresses and and talks about some of those varieties of roles and gifts that have been given over time to the church and its individual members. That's an important text. But the overall point is every member has their place. Every member has their function. Biblically speaking, and I emphasize here biblically speaking, there is no such thing as an inactive church member. When we um, work in church office and and so forth, sometimes we use software that sort of has your names in it and basic information, that kind of thing. A lot of those church software programs, church organization programs, um, you know, it has a place for a name and then a lot of times there's a little button beside it that says active, or inactive, and you're supposed to click one of those. That may be something needed in a software, but there is no such thing in the Bible as a Christian who is inactive, as a church member who is not a functioning member of the church. There just isn't. That category doesn't exist. Now, if we take our cues for membership from the world then we can have a situation like that, sure. But it will not be a biblical church membership, you see. It will not be pleasing to God. It will not glorify the head of the church, Jesus. It will not testify to the world of the truth of the gospel. Far from it. And so I think one of the things that I, preaching to me too here, that I ought to be doing regularly as a member of this church is asking myself this question. How can I best serve the church of Jesus Christ? How can I better serve the church of which I have been made a member? So I encourage you, to ask yourself that question today and and ask it honestly. How can I best or better serve 
the church. Consider it and meditate upon it and maybe have your Bible open to a passage like 1 Corinthians 12 and maybe as you meditate upon it, pray about it. For the body does not consist of one member, but many. As it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. So there are many parts, but one body. God has so composed the body that there may be no divisions in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffer, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Today as we conclude, we offer the invitation of the head of the church, Christ Jesus. To any who might need to come before the church and ask for help, prayer, support. Any who might uh, be interested in becoming a part of the body. Uh, We don't add you, the Lord does. And if you need to obey the gospel and be baptized into Christ today. Or or recommit yourself to your service and need prayers for strength in doing that. We would love to take time to, to tend to those things. But I I do ask you to think about the question that we raised this morning in light of Scripture. If we can help you in some way this morning, won't you come while we stand and sing this last song?